Good evening. So if you don't know who I am, my name's John Hopkins. I joined the church with my then new wife, Lucy, in October 2007. And we served in the church and we're part of the church um, for until about this time of the year, September 2016. And then we went as mission partners to Cape Town. And um, I have three children. Um, I have Bethany, who is now 12. She used to dance around at the front in the morning services. Um, Timothy, who's nine. And Rachel, who is six. So <clears throat> I work with an organization in Cape Town called U-Turn. We work with homeless people. And it's very apt that the topic when I said I was coming and Greg asked, do you want to come and speak? And I actually used to do, I'd be on the, on the preaching road in the evenings frequently around sort of 2012, 13, 14, 15. So I do recognize some, some friendly faces here, which is great. And it's on, the topic is kindness. Because we've been doing a, a, a series on the fruits of the spirit. And I'm going to read from, if I can get into the Bible, um, Colossians verse 3. Don't worry, I know the fruits of spirits in Galatians, but we're going to read from Colossians 3, um, verses 5 through to 15. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these things, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived, but now you must also rid yourselves of all such things as these, anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other since you've taken off your old self with its practices and have put on the new self which is being renewed in the knowledge and image of its creator. Here there is no Gentile or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another if any of you has a grievance against someone. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Thanks be to God. So, you'll realize that Galatians 5, 22 and 23, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And I had a little look at the back catalogue on the All Saints website, and I noticed you've done love, joy, peace, and patience amidst the going through the books of the Bible. And so, now is the fifth in that list of kindness. So let me, first of all, paint you a picture. You're walking down the street and you see someone sitting outside Peckham Rye, outside the train station, looking disheveled and asking for money. You're conflicted. On the one hand, you remember Jesus said, whatever you did for the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. That's in Matthew 25, verse 40. Jesus called on us to give to the poor. Yet on the other hand, you wonder, is giving money going to help? You lean in a little closer, and a strong smell of alcohol rises above some poor body odour. The person obviously hasn't had anywhere to wash themselves for some time, and your heart breaks. You really feel for this person. But do you give them some money that they're asking for? Do you pop to McDonald's and buy them some food? Will that help? Won't they just spend the money on more alcohol? What kind of thing do you do in this situation? Now, I'm sure many of you have come across this situation many times. And I've been struck. It's been two years since I've been back in London. In the, last, in the few days I've spent here, I've really noticed a lot more rough sleepers begging outside the train stations and, and around, certainly in this area. What's the kind thing to do? 
What about another story? Imagine being 16 years old, growing up in a poor family and a poor neighborhood. Gangsterism is rife, drugs are everywhere. You fall in with the wrong crowd, and soon you're also hooked on the drugs. You meet a man, you have two kids, but you're still on the drugs. Finally, you get kicked out of home because you're constantly stealing to feed that habit. You land up on the street, estranged from your children. Life hits rock bottom. You figure out how to survive, where to get a meal each day, who to speak to,、um, where to, where's the good place for begging to get money. And this is how you earn some money to feed your addiction. Life isn't great, but you know how to survive. And you get stuck on the street. Now, this isn't a made up story. This is the story of Bianca, who's pictured here. And unfortunately, this story is not a one off, and in Cape Town, there are over 14,000 homeless people. That's rough sleepers. There's many more in informal dwellings and, and, and et cetera. Now, in the UK, the rough sleeper count is somewhere between, well, in London, sometimes it's 7,000, sometimes it's 2,000. It's very hard to count. But in a city less than half the size of London, we've got more than double the problem. And you see it much more viscerally every single day. And I've heard versions of Bianca's story many times. How do we respond with kindness? So, the next few minutes, I'm going to unpack this by looking at three questions. Firstly, what is kindness? And let's, we're going to look at what the Bible says about kindness. Secondly, we're going to look at how we can clothe ourselves daily with kindness. And then, thirdly, we're going to, I'm going to look a bit more at the example of U turn, about how to, this can actually help when looking specifically at people who are stuck living in homelessness、um, and helping them to leave the street long term. So, firstly, what is kindness? So, kindness, according to Wikipedia, you know, that really reliable source, is a type of behavior marked by acts of generosity, consideration, rendering assistance, or concern for others without expecting praise or reward in return. So, when we think of kindness, we think like this word cloud compassion, mercy. Um, generosity, tolerance, courtesy, charity. So there's, there's lots of synonyms we use in our language. What does the Bible say? Well, in the NIV, there were 56 mentions of kindness 45 in the Old Testament, 11 in the New Testament. Kindness is an attribute of God and a quality that's desirable, but unfortunately not often found in us. So in the Old Testament, The Hebrew word is often translated as chesed. And that's my best Hebrew pronunciation, chesed. And this word encompasses steadfast love, mercy, loyalty. And it's actually more frequently used to describe God's covenant love for his people, for us, or in the Old Testament, for the Jewish nation. And For instance, in Psalm 136, the refrain, His love endures forever, His love endures forever, speaks to this enduring, faithful kindness of God. And this chesed kindness is active, it's persistent, demonstrating that God's kindness is not just about a feeling, but is evidenced through His actions towards humanity. And you saw the biggest impact of that. Uh, action in him sending Jesus Christ. In the New Testament, the focus is actually a lot more on the kindness that is expected of us as followers of Christ, as Christians. And the Greek word for kindness is Christotes. And it's, a word that, it's the word that's used in the fruits of the Spirit in Galatians 5 22. Now, here kindness is listed among the other attributes the Holy Spirit cultivates in believers. And this is the, the series that we're doing at the moment. Signifying that true kindness is a result of God's work in us. And it's not just human effort 
but it stems from a transformed heart that seeks to reflect God's nature. Now, Jesus, as we know, exemplifies ultimate kindness in his earthly ministry. He consistently showed compassion and care for the marginalized in society. Um, he commands us to love our enemies. The parable of the Good Samaritan, he says this kindness needs to transcend social and ethic, um, ethnic boundaries. The Samaritan's act of kindness towards the injured man teaches us that true kindness is sacrificial and it's selfless. It's people willing to go out of their way to help those in need, regardless of their background. And it's a radical kindness that mirrors God's own grace and mercy to us. So in essence, biblical kindness is an expression of God's love through us. So it's us being the hands and feet of Jesus. It's characterised by mercy, compassion and a willingness to put others' needs above our own. However, it doesn't come naturally. And Paul, in writing the, to the Colossians, says in chapter 3, verse 12, as I read just now, Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness and patience. As God's chosen people, clothe yourselves. So Paul gives us a list of things we need to put on daily as followers of Christ. Compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience, peace, gratitude. Big overlap with his list of the fruits of the Spirit to the Ephesians, to the Galatians, sorry. They're not things, so he's saying they're not things that necessarily come naturally or automatically. Now think, if you don't physically clothe yourselves each morning, going to work, school, or out to visit friends could be embarrassing depending on what you wear in bed. In the same way, we need to clothe ourselves daily with the fruits of the Spirit. So what can we do to clothe ourselves in kindness? Now, our church in Cape Town has a theme every year. This year, the theme is mission and mercy. Last year, it was prayer. The year before, it was the year of kindness. And in the year of kindness, there were frequent reminders that we are to be the salt and light in our community. And what better way to do that than undertake acts of kindness? They could be small or large, anonymous or not, with a family member or a stranger. Now, Reader's Digest in 2020, a couple of months ago, published an article, 110 Random Acts of Kindness to Make the World a Better Place. And this slide shows some suggestions. Now, some are small, but could be an important gesture to someone else, like holding a door or reading a book with your child, even though you're exhausted and it's been a long day. Could be sending a text message to someone, just say, well, how are you? It, it could be making a meal for someone that's just had a baby or there's been a bereavement. It could be offering to pray with someone giving an anonymous financial gift to someone who you know is struggling financially. There's lots of different things. As I said, big or small, anonymous, in, in person. Lots of different acts of kindness we can do to those around us to be that salt and light. And whatever it is, it's about clothing ourselves daily with kindness and compassion. But exactly what is kind in every situation isn't always obvious. Because let's revisit the situation I, I gave at the beginning. Someone sitting outside the train station asking for money. Should we give to that person who's begging? Well, the answer to this is it depends. Now, in a book written by two Christians, Steve Corbett and Brian Fickett, it's called When Helping Hurts. It's a similar book that's UK based, it's called Toxic Charity. And they say, when helping hurts, how to alleviate poverty without hurting the poor and yourself. And it provides a really helpful model. The book looks at Christians' response to poverty, and it argues the church's mission should be to help the poor and the destitute. But often the way that Christians do this, which is often through indiscriminately giving money and goods, because it's the quick thing to do to relieve your guilt, is actually harmful to both Christians 
and the people they're trying to help. This is because there are different kinds of need at different times. Let me explain. So, on the slide, imagine, and this is a, a real example because there's been, now, everyone says, oh, you've come from the sun to summer in here. I'm like, no, no, it's winter in Cape Town, dark, cold, and there's been terrible flooding recently. So 20 millimeters of rain in four days last week. That's, that's eight inches. It's a lot of rain. There's been terrible flooding. So imagine there's terrible flooding. You're in an informal settlement in a shack, which is literally a two-by-two two room made of corrugated iron. About a million people in Cape Town live, about 25% of the population live in such a structure. That flood happens. Then, what's that person need? They need relief. Why? To stabilize the situation. They need warm clothes, they need blankets, they've lost their food, they've lost their belongings. Maybe the, the, the shack has fallen over, they need shelter. And the purpose here is there's been a recent trauma, but it needs to be short-term, immediate help. And it's very one-sided from the, I have you currently don't, let me give to you. Definitely needed. Not in every situation. Next. Because at some point, if you keep giving to that person, keep giving and saying, oh, well, you're staying here, no, let me keep feeding you, keep giving you clothing, keep doing, that's not going to help the person. It's going to create dependence. And actually, it's at some point going, right, the immediate need is met, now it's turning to rehabilitation. Let's return you to independence. Let's get you accommodation. Let's get you that roof back over your head. Let's get you uh, food, and etc. And then help you to do it yourself. And that requires partnership. And because if we keep doing relief, the person gets more and more and more, more dependent, as I said. But actually, just stopping at rehab and going, the person's sleeping in a, a shack, it's, it's inadequate accommodation isn't enough. The next step is development. And it's how do you help the person to increase resilience, but also improve their situation. And this is a focus on building on the person's strengths and then helping them in that process. So you turn in every situation, we look at, is it relief that's needed? We've just uh, partnered with a local Anglican church. They've opened up their church hall. They're now sheltering people who had nowhere to stay through the storms. Just like that, we're providing that immediate relief. But then it's working through, okay, how can we help with rehabilitation and development? And I'll talk about more of that in a sec. So, helping in the wrong way can be harmful, and we need to be discerning and see what type of help is needed in different situations. So, what does U-Turn do, and how do we kindly respond to homelessness? Well, U-Turn, in its approach, is constantly trying to match the right help at the right time to the right need, because the aim is to help someone walk a sustainable path out of homelessness. Therefore, we say our aim is to equip people and local communities with the skills to overcome homelessness. Now, this is done through a long term, takes two, two and a half years, developmental approach, and it can be split into four separate steps. First of all, you start with building readiness for change. Someone is sleeping on the street. We actually work with the community, and they buy a voucher. That voucher, instead of giving some money to somebody who's sat outside the train station, and you know that giving the money or giving the food, I've talked to a lot of people on the street, and they've said, that just kept me in that situation. But given the voucher, it says, you, here is a voucher for a meal or clothing or safe accommodation tonight. You can go to a centre, a day centre, a drop-in centre. You can redeem that voucher. But the best thing about that is that voucher is a referral ticket to the centre, which is full of people who are trained professionals and people with lived experience who are now helping guys to go, look, change is possible. And the whole purpose of the centre is building readiness for change. Psychologically, you're, it's called pre-contemplative, you're stuck in, your, in this, this mindset. You don't know change is possible, you're in survival mode. And it's about playing games, it's about having discussions, it's Bible study. 
it's helping people, and people can earn vouchers and then get their own meals, and so all of that, in order to get ready for change. As soon as a person's ready for change, now 80-something percent have some sort of substance use disorder, drugs, alcohol, mainly a survival mechanism to live on the streets, then that person, we put them in a shelter, a very limited shelter spaces, and we send them to an outpatient drug rehab program. Those that don't need it, go straight into the next stage. When that finishes three months later, a lot of people go, great, you're in a shelter, you're clean, go and get a job. If you've never worked, if you were brought up in a really abusive situation, poor emotional regulation, um, just lack of skills, all sorts of other problems. So you tell me we have a work readiness program and we run some different businesses. And the whole point of the program is to place someone in one of our social enterprises. So you've seen the charity shops on Peckham Rye, or we staff our charity shops with people on the program. And that gives them work opportunity. And one day a week, they get therapy, support, skills training, everything else. They go back and apply it, get support, go back and apply. After about 18 months, they're ready to graduate onto the fourth phase, which is um, independence. And it's then getting into open labor market employment and, and support. So each step is graded to help the person walk along this pathway. Not setting up something that they're going to fail at, but it's just taking it step by step by step over a long period of time. And this program leads to and um, next one, Jonathan. <laughs> this program is, it actually is that we follow people up six months after they leave the program, and we find that actually 90% of people six months later are still employed, still sober, and in independent accommodation. No longer a homeless shelter or anything. So it sticks, it lasts. We are getting data on two years, three years, four years, and about two years, it's probably about 80% of improving our aftercare support. But it's very hard. For drug addicts, normally it's about 20% um, after six months. Maybe a little bit higher, but often it's, it's certainly in, in um, primary rehab, it's much lower. So that's a bit of the process. But key to this, this is why I love working with U-Turn, is it's on top of the practical needs being met, it's actually the foundation of what we do is the belief that God made every person intrinsically valuable and no one should have to live on the street. And that's what motivates us about what we do. We're the hands and feet of Jesus. So whilst we've helped meet physical needs throughout the four steps I've described, all of the programs are delivered to a biblical worldview and we work through a discipleship approach to introduce people to the good news of Jesus and grow them as disciples. Interestingly, during our very hard lockdown in Cape Town, where we weren't even allowed out the house to exercise, you're only allowed once a week to go and buy food, working with the homeless population who had nowhere to be and were harassed by the police for trying to get to our centre until we spoke to them and said, they're allowed to go and get food and we're providing humanitarian service here. As soon as things opened up a bit, I, I worked at, specifically at our centre during that time. The guys came up to me and went, John, all your churches have gone online. Our church in Cape Town didn't go online. We just joined the All Saints online services and it was great to be part of that family. But all your churches have gone online. We have nothing. Please, the first service they wanted after the meal was the Bible study back so they could actually commune and discuss about God because that was how important this part of the program was for them. And that was so encouraging in terms of that, that they wanted that, 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 that communion. And so as a staff, we are clothing ourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. And whilst we use the latest tools to bring about positive behavior change, we are also sharing Christ and making him known daily. Now, this comes from our founding. 25 years ago, Colleen Lewis, our founder, saw two homeless people walking down the road. One was pushing the other in a shopping trolley. Her heart went out to them and she thought, these guys need Jesus. They also look hungry. So she said to them, look, I want to tell you about Jesus, who I love, but would you like lunch? And I'll talk. And they said, sure. 
So they came in, they sat, they called it their stoop, their porch, and she talked to them and said, look, if you want to find out more, if you want to come back again next week, come back. Well, next week, eight people came back, then it was 15, then it was 20, then it was 30. This was in a nice sub-middle class suburb. Imagine going to the, the nice part of Denmark Hill and sort of doing that from your... You're going to get the neighbours complaining. The, 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 her neighbours got a court interdict to stop her doing what she was doing. It moved to St Stephen's Church, the church I go to now. And they met in the cottage there, encouraged to come on a Sunday. It outgrew the church, and it's now across Cape Town. And we're actually now partnering with churches in Johannesburg to do exactly the same. And they're opening their buildings during the week in order to do this, exactly this. And so we actually have this big, hairy, audacious goal to provide an effective life change pathway. So that's a pathway off the streets that's accessible to every homeless person in South Africa. This is 25 years, and we're figuring out how to do it. But it's exciting because we've, we're three times larger than we were as an organization in 2020. Lots of growing pains, lots of difficulties. I'm one of the senior managers there, overseeing a lot of this stuff and building relationships with churches and, and, and others. And it's very exciting work that's happening. But the need is growing and growing and growing. Unemployment rate in South Africa, in Cape Town, is about 30%. It's very high. People are losing their jobs, landing up on the street. The, the social safety net, the unemployment benefit per month is £17 to feed a family. It, so there is no safety net. So we're seeing the problem growing. We are growing by God's grace. And so at the beginning, I talked about the story of Bianca. Now, here is a short video in her words about what happened next. I grew up in an area called Athlon from a staunch Catholic background. I've got five, six brothers and I've got one sister. We didn't come from a very rich background. We actually came from quite a poor background where my parents, you know, they could give us what they could give us. Being 16 years old and being vulnerable and living in an area where gangsterism was high, so was drugs. I got involved with the wrong people. And in that interim, while I was busy doing drugs, um, my father passed on, my mother passed on. I lost all connection with my family. Drugs has a way of robbing you of the relationships and the people that you love. And then one evening, I was busy walking down the road in Eatfield, and I walked up with this guy, and he said to me that, um, He's given himself to God and um, he wants to introduce me to a place that he knows him, a place called Newton. And I sat there that night with him. I remember it was still in the church called God. I've been doing drugs for so many years and really, I really want to do this. I, I, I'm tired of feeling me. I was tired of being high. I was tired of what we call the struggle. I was tired of being deceitful and being, being used. Yes, I when I was getting tired of those things, and also what I was tired of was because we so much more. But I was finding something new. I was introduced to God, somebody that I forgot to ask for help. For once in my 22 years of my life, I found peace. I could actually start learning the process of forgiving me for the things I'd done. And, and for what I was doing to the other people, what I was doing to my children. I'm a supervisor at U-Turn now. My relationship has been built again with my children. It's been built again with my brothers and my sister. I found inner peace with myself. I've learned to become more confident. And everything I do is all in the work of God now. The purpose and the desires of my heart has changed. God said, love each other like I've loved you. you know? 
to find that, just to find that, and to, to, to absorb the, 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 the gift of forgiveness. And for the younger generation coming through, is to persevere, no matter what challenges come your way. You know what? Just face your challenges here on, own it, embrace it, and don't give up. Because God never gave up on us, so why should we give up? God never gave up on us, so why should we give up? 16 years in addiction, estranged from her children. Bianca is now, she's actually not even the supervisor now, she became a store manager. Now she oversees seven charity shops, feeding into the lives of about 50 people who are on the U-Turn Life Change program um, at any one time. And back with her husband, kids, relationship rebuilt, restored, forgiveness, and yeah, an incredible change, an incredible journey. She's using that experience to then feed into the lives of others, which is, is phenomenal. Now, you can succeed on the U-turn program without being a Christian, without becoming a Christian. We've had atheists, agnostics, Muslims successfully come through the program. But it's that turning to Christ there's, the, 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 there's, there's one guy who, I saw him walk around the office, and I was like, wow, it's just his face was aglow. I said, well, what happened to him? He was, a former, he, was, he was a Muslim. He'd given his life to Christ, and you could see it in him. And I had a chat to his caseworker, and she said there was so much unforgiveness, so much um, unrepentance, so much pain from the past. Before he came to us, he didn't even exist. He never got a birth certificate. So he could never get a job. He could never get, he didn't exist in the, in the eyes of the state. And yet he, through the program, gave his life to Christ. And she said, it saved me nine months. We would have got there. But it's that forgiveness of Christ. It's that the blood of the lamb. And I looked at him. It's a bit like Greg was talking about this morning. It's like that slap in the, if you were there, that sort of slap in the face with the cold water. It's that feeling of, that's the same gospel that I have. It's the same Jesus that I know. But he's emanating this and he's seeing it really, really, really clearly. So how do we, as Paul exhorts us in Colossians 3, put to death whatever belongs to our earthly nature and clothe ourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. So finally, how can you grow in kindness? How can we grow in kindness? Three ideas. One, commit to doing at least one kind thing this week to someone in your life or to a stranger. Make that a habit. If you're an overachiever, like I see many of you are, one kind thing every day. Doesn't have to be big. Doesn't have to be difficult or expensive. Can be small, can be easy, but be inventive and be intentional. Secondly, ask in every situation, am I helping here or am I hurting? Think about the bigger picture. Does there need to be relief, rehabilitation or development? You only know that if you build relationship and then link to the support people, uh, to support the people in need. So whether it's a homeless person, a refugee, or someone in debt, and I see the CAP banner at the back, that's what CAP does, and it's a phenomenal program. And thirdly, if you feel the need, and I know that some of you already do, and I know the church does, but support you to help us to grow and do more of what we're doing. We have a stewardship services account in the UK, so you can give tax efficiently. I'm actually, to, to save you some, some money, I get a local salary from them, which is supported by, by donations here and by the church. But we're looking to see, can I cover the full cost of my salary? So more and more and more of those funds they raise locally can actually go to growing the program and helping more and more people living on, currently living on the street. So... 
how do we, as Paul says in Colossians 3 verse 12, therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with kindness this week. Lord Jesus, I just pray that you you would touch each of our hearts. You would help us to know, put it on our minds, who it is, what we should be doing to cultivate and clothe ourselves daily with that attitude and that spirit and that behavior of kindness. Help us to respond to people in need that's going to really help and not hurt. And Lord, I pray as I travel back to South Africa tomorrow and pick up all the things that are happening with U-Turn, that it, Lord, you would just guide our ways and our steps, open the right doors, close the wrong ones. And Lord, we would be faithful to you and walk in your ways. Amen.